Um, I am glad to be here. Uh, I, I probably, in some ways, I probably feel a little more nervous this time than I did last time. Uh, not sure why, but I am glad that I'm here. And uh, I have been in prayer much about coming. And uh, Kyle asked me how I was. You know, yesterday morning we got up, or no, it was last night. We were going to go into the living room and visit. And he said, you know, how are you doing? Do you need to study or anything like that? Well, every day around 3 o'clock, my brain just shuts down. There's no more studying at that point. And I told him, I said, no, I'm in sheer panic mode right now. So, but this morning I felt, I just felt the grace of God and, and things were so clear, at least this morning, so we can hold that, I'm, I'm hoping. If you do have your Bibles with you, would you open them up to Acts chapter 26, and in this, this early part of the, of the service today, I want to talk to you about something that God has given every believer, and it's something that you have in a personal way. Everybody has it, but everybody has it in a personal way. And I want to talk to us today how it can be used as a powerful tool to preach or to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I'm talking about is your testimony of how God saved you. So it's, I'm going to read most of the chapter. I think in the bulletin I actually had told Kyle all you know through 32, but I think we're actually going to go through 23. But I want to go to prayer first, and then we will we'll, we'll look at this. Father, this morning I I do want to just come before you and thank you, God, for this opportunity, this this privilege it is to be here. And the honor that it is, God, to, to be able to, to preach and teach your word. Uh, it's, it's something that, that you have given me a desire to do. And, and I'm thankful, Lord, that there's never a time, Lord, where my confidence is in my ability. But God, I know how much I need you in these things. And, and I don't ever want to move away from that. My prayer today, Father, is that we could could bless our brethren here, that we would be blessed in return, that God, that you would be glorified today in all that we're doing, that your word would be proclaimed and Christ be exalted. In his name we pray, amen. In Acts 26, what we see is we see a time when, when Paul has been put in jail, in prison, he is actually awaiting to go to Rome. And, uh, and what has happened here is, is King Agrippa has come, and, and, and he's familiar with Paul. He's familiar with this, this sect, this Christian group. And, and he comes, and he wants to, to hear what Paul really has to say. And so what we're going to look at is this. I want to talk about how your testimony is a tool for sharing the gospel. And I want you to know something. There's so many doctrines that come out of the book of Acts that churches have, have, have kind of fallen away from what the, the truth of what we're really about is. And, and what we do is we highlight certain things in the book of Acts. I mean, there's, there's churches that will, and I'm not going to really bring up things, but they'll focus on a certain part. I want you to know that the book of Acts is, is, is a historical narrative. It's not exactly where we get our doctrine. We look to the epistles for that, but but it, it teaches us things. And I want you to know this, that in the book of Acts, God gives different things, and they're used as a platform to preach the gospel. I mean, we start in Acts 2, and we look at, you know, here they're speaking in the tongues of the nations where everybody that was in Jerusalem at that time, and they're hearing it in their own language. Well, it wasn't for this idea of speaking in tongues so much as it was that what happened, Peter began to proclaim the gospel. You see people being healed, and it wasn't so we would have a healing service. It was to proclaim the gospel. Paul is put in jail, and now he has the opportunity to give his testimony for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel. So, Listen, to I want, these are some things to know about your testimony. And this is the first one. You are not the star of your testimony. 
Okay? Your testimony primarily is about God working in your life. You run second fiddle to the Lord, okay? So you're not the star of your own testimony. Your testimony is proclaiming, it is glorifying God and how He worked in your life to save you. The, the events that took place that led to this place. The second thing you always want to remember is this. Your testimony should have, there should always be this, these four steps. There should be a pre-conversion. This is what my life was like. This is where I was. And that will be different details in everyone's life. Then you're going to have this, what we call a divine appointment. And this divine appointment is that time that God came in and everything changed. Now, for some people, that's very clear, and we'll read about Paul. Paul has a very clear divine appointment. Other people don't. I mean, it's not as clear, but we can always point back to this time in my life when everything changed. The third point on that is, there is at that point, there is this turning point where Jesus is calling you to follow Him. I mean, so often we hear people's testimonies and we hear about being saved, but we see no point where we see any signs of repentance. We see no signs of a desire to follow Christ, a desire to serve Christ. We don't see those things. And then the last one is this. Your testimony, especially in the giving of your testimony, there should always be a proclamation of the gospel. And why do I say that? Because oftentimes in a lot of churches, we'll, we'll hear about somebody and they're going to share their testimony. And in their testimony, all we hear about is them. And, and, and the spotlight is on them. I mean, I've heard testimonies and these guys are, are sometimes ladies. They, they were, nobody can just be mediocre, okay? I mean, Paul has already claimed the title of chief of sinners. But yet, every testimony comes around, it was like, I was the, the toughest guy in town. I was the worst drug addict. I was the worst this or that. And, and it's like that, that may have been true somewhat, but they never seem to leave that. There seems to almost be a lot of pride in being the worst at whatever they were. And then you hear about how that they did, you know, and all this. Okay. So the point of your testimony is to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. Next point is this. You need to write down your testimony. Why? Not that it's a legalistic rule. Write it down. Because you're going to leave a legacy for those, your grandchildren who come after you. It helps to know this too. When you start writing it down, it you start thinking back and what God really did in my life. And, and, and aside from that, you need to learn to do this. You need to learn to do your testimony in like a, a one or two minute type little clip. I look at John back there street preaching. I've had people come by and they'll say, oh, you're just one of those do-gooders, you know, it's like you were raised preaching. And I'll say, no, I was no different than you, man. I was a wicked sinner. These were my desires. Boom, there's my pre-conversion. But there was a day that Jesus came into my life and He changed me. I don't come up here because anybody's paying me to do it. I come because I care about you. I mean, we see this point in this little testimony, a divine appointment. And Jesus has called me to proclaim the gospel. Here's the, the call, the commission to follow Him. And then we share the gospel. And I can do that in about a minute or two. You heard just quickly, it would be a little longer than that on the streets. And I want you to know this about your, your conversion. Your conversion is a miracle of God. Now, I'm, I'm going to get Kyle right now, okay? I called him the other night and I, I said, I, I'm having this thought. I'd, I'd like to kind of share my testimony. And he said, that would be fantastic. Now, me and Kyle are, are different in this aspect. He was raised up in church in a, a very Christian home. I was not. And oftentimes we get this idea that people have these really neat conversion stories. And others don't. I want you to know sitting here today that if you are a believer in Christ, your testimony is nothing short 
of a miracle. So let's get started. In verse 1, he says, Agrippa said to Paul, he says, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And then Paul, he stretched forth the hand and he answered for himself. And he says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews. And then he says, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech you to hear me patiently. So oftentimes in our testimony, we need to know who we're talking to. We need to know the, the crowd that we're dealing with. And he says, I know that you're aware of the things I'm going to be talking about, Agrippa, and I'm so glad to be sharing this with you. That's what Paul's saying. And then he says this. He starts with his pre-conversion. He says, My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, he says, know all the Jews. He says, they all know me. They, they knew exactly who I was. And he says, and they knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, if they would come forth and tell you, they would say this. He says that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand and, and, and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto the promise which our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which sake, for, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And then he says this, why should it be thought a, a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Ah, oh, the resurrection that Jesus rose from the dead. He says, I'm being, I'm being held in, in prison right now because of this hope. And if they would testify, they would tell you that how I lived my life. And then he says this, he says, I verily, th I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Now, here's Paul's pre-conversion. You want to know the life I lived? Here's what it was. I had such a zeal to serve God that I was the persecutor of the church. My main goal was to put this name of Jesus out of everybody's mind, to lock up anyone who called on His name, put them in prison, even put them to death if need be. He said, that's what I was doing before I had a divine appointment. And I was actually on my way to Damascus. And I had authority to put in jail everyone who called on His name. But look what happened. Here's His divine appointment. At midday, O King... I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. I have no doubt that when Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? He knew exactly the voice of the one that was talking to him. And so here's what happened with Paul. I mean, I hear people say all the time, I've been seeking God all my life. Well, I, I, I can promise you on, on one hand, Paul would have said that. Now, the problem with that statement is, God says there's none that seeks after me, not even one. But here was Paul thinking he was actually serving God, seeking God, doing God's will, and guess who shows up? 
God shows up. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, let's be honest, that is a powerful testimony. We just got to be honest. When the Lord Himself shows up and speaks audibly where you can hear it, and He says, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So we see this divine appointment. And then what do we see? We see this charge. We see this call given to Paul. We see an appointment given to him. And he says this, But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the, from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So we see this call. And what do we see Paul do now? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them, of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple, and they went about to kill me. Now what he's saying is this, he's saying, when God called me, when He changed me, when He, when he caused me to be born from above, He gave me a commission. And in that commission, what do we do? We follow Christ where He leads us. But he, he, he pointed it out. He says, I'm going to send you amongst the Gentiles. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine the pride that has to, to crumble at this point? Here's this, this Jew of Jews, this Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, and God's going to send him to the Gentiles? To preach the gospel that they could be saved also? And Paul says, I wasn't disobedient. I stood up and I followed him. And I first went to Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea. Then, then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews, they caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. And having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. And then listen to verse 23. That Christ should suffer, and that He should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Do you see what Paul just did? He's given a testimony, right? But what does he do in verse 23? He starts proclaiming the gospel to Agrippa. Did anybody get the opportunity to see Ben Shapiro interview John MacArthur? Ah, no, there's people like, oh, well, John, he said things that weren't... Okay, enough of that nonsense. I didn't agree. I don't agree with John on everything. But oh my goodness, he was given the opportunity and what did he do? He weaved the gospel right in there to Ben Shapiro. Oh, it was fantastic. And that's what's going on here. Now I'm not going to finish this chapter, but what do we see happening? Right at this moment when he begins to really bear down and share the gospel, we see, we see Festus with a loud voice, Ah, oh, Paul, you're crazy, right? Ah, oh, didn't Satan always show up in these times? Now, why do I say this stuff? See, I read something the other day 
I read a quote by one of my favorite pastors and theologians. He's gone on to be with the Lord now, so I'm not going to say his name. But I read this, and his quote was this. He said, your testimony is not the gospel. And when our favorite guys say this, we all jump on there and we're all like, yeah, amen. I said, wait a second. I agree with that. My testimony is not the gospel. But the gospel is always present in my testimony. So when I talked to Kyle, I came last time and it was kind of a whirlwind trip. We kind of was here and then we were gone. And quite honestly, I didn't really expect to get an invitation, not like in a mean way. I just, I wasn't really expecting that. So I'm, I'm really, I was really glad and thrilled that Kyle had contacted me and said, hey, I'd like to have you back. And I said, great. And, uh, but I, I do, I want to share with you. See, I, I can agree with Paul in, in some ways. My, my testimony is similar to Paul's in some ways. You see, I, I was, I, I, and actually, I grew up, I wasn't, from my youth, I wasn't in church. I was quite the little heathen. I wasn't the worst. See, I don't have that testimony. I wasn't the worst heathen out there. I was just pretty good at it, you know? And then when at about the age of 16, I, I meet this young lady over here who became my wife, and I started attending church with her. She'd been raised up in church where she was from. That's her testimony. I mean, for me to get dressed up to go to church, well, I remember one day I, I grabbed my best concert shirt. It was Sammy Hagar. I remember, I mean, this is so bad, but on the back, it, his album at that time was called Rock is in My Blood. And that's what, I mean, those are almost Christian words, right? Rock and blood, yeah. It was, it was like, I looked and I said, here's one of my better shirts. This is what I'm wearing to church. This is Sunday morning. So I, did, I was pretty much clueless. But what happened was I, I, I got baptized in, in this church and, and then, and then I, I got this desire and, and, and I can remember, you know, desiring to be in church and all these things. And, but through the years, I, I found that, that I was caught up in religion just like Paul. And as the years went on, I, I began to refine this. I, I got pretty good at it. And I, and I was, now listen, was I genuine? Was I sincere in everything I was doing? Absolutely. Never confuse genuine and sincere with truth. It does not equate to equal truth. And here's what happened. Every, everything started to not make sense. Or not everything. Some things just started to not make sense to me. We had a view that we were the only ones getting to go to heaven. I started asking, why, why do we think that? Why do we think that? And, and so things began to unravel. And I was sharing this with Kyle the other night. I, I came to a point, I had moved to Montana when I was 27 year, years old in 1993. And in 2000, we moved back. I became an elder in the church that I had been baptized in. And all of a sudden, nothing made sense to me. That's pretty alarming when you feel like this is the rest of your life. This is what your, your whole life. For 18 years, everything in my life was in that church. Every friend, every trip we took was, it was centered upon that. Now let me back you up real quick before I tell you what happened in Oklahoma, this prayer. When I was in Montana, there was one morning, I would always go up and light the fires at the church. I would pray while I was there. I typically, for whatever reason, I would finish my prayer walking back to my house. We lived in a really small town. It was just a neat little place. And I remember praying that Sunday morning that all of the brethren would be in church. And our idea of laboring for the Lord was all in the service. We kind of had an open type meeting where everybody could present themselves. You could pray, testify, you know, preach if you felt called to preach. I mean, you know, sing a song, whatever. It wasn't no structure to it. And so the goal was to get all of the brethren there. And I remember the thought hit me. I thought, what if all of the brethren came today? Do we die and go to heaven then? Is that, is that the end of what we're doing here? And I remember saying this. 
I remember saying, Lord, I feel like I'm missing something really big. And I said, Lord, it's really big. And I said, it's so big, I, I can't see it. About a year or so later, we moved back to Oklahoma. I'd been ordained an elder. And, and instead of everything being great, I was beyond miserable. I was questioning everything. And I couldn't share this with anybody. I couldn't share it inside the church because I'd seen guys who'd done that and they got ostracized. They were marked. They, they never had a life ever of, of being received in the church again. So I could not talk to anybody in the church. I didn't dare talk to somebody like you guys outside the church. Y'all wanted me out of that church anyway. I could not trust you. I could not trust anyone. I was praying one morning. My prayer life had been reduced to about a three minute drive. And as I'm praying, I'm kind of going through my prayer. And all of a sudden I stopped and I said, Lord, I just hate praying. I hate reading my Bible. I hate going to church. I hate that I'm in Oklahoma. I hate that I let him ordain me an elder. I just hated it all. Now, I, I didn't really hate praying. I, you know what I'm saying? But that's where I was at. Now, when you realize that you're in the middle of prayer and this is what you have just said to God, this is a little alarming. And then I cried out. I said, I want Jesus Christ to be alive in me. And I don't feel like he is. And it was somewhere right at that same time we were working up in Edmond, Oklahoma. On a, on a, a big church of Christ up there had built a new building and they were turning their old church into a Christian school. And we were building rooms in it. And I'd got to the point that I really didn't want to be around anybody. I, I just, I just wanted to be by myself and I didn't go to lunch with them and I was just at this building completely by myself. And I picked up a, a Christian book off the shelf that they had left and I opened it up and I, I don't really remember what it exactly said, but it was this. It was basically the idea of trying to make myself acceptable according to religion, re rules, things like that. And I broke. I was on my hands and my knees, bawling. Now I get choked up a little bit. I'm not a choking up kind of guy, okay? That's just not me, but it happens. But in this instance, I was bawling to the point that my part of my mind was thinking, please God, don't let anybody be in this building because they're going to hear me. And this will be so embarrassing. Because if somebody would have walked in, I could not have stopped. I was telling Kyle this, and he asked me, he says, do you feel like he was born again in, in the church he was in? And I said, it's hard to say. It's hard to say when you think you're serving the Lord and you're preaching and you're doing all these things. And I asked my wife after that, I went... Kyle laughed at me the other day. I said, yeah, I'm going to go run. And he's like, <laughs> okay, I can run still. But I went walking a few laps. And as I was walking, I was like, you know, Lord, that is odd, you know. So I, I came back, you know, this is the thought of like, when, when, when did that happen? And so I, I looked at my wife and I said, just you observing my life, when would you say, that, I, that you thought I was truly born again. She said, probably that day that you broke. And I said, why do you say that? She said, because it was at that point that you knew that your salvation was in Christ and in Him alone. She said, anybody that had your testimony prior to that, you would tell them today, if you're trusting in that, you're not saved. And I was like, wow, you use my own stuff on me. Awesome. You see, that was that divine appointment that Paul had.
And at that point, I knew I could no longer stay where I was at. Because I was in a place that their idea of how you go to heaven is you have to be in this church. You see, their gospel basically would be you must be in this church. And this revelation that I had was you must be in Christ. I had people in the church that were angry with me because I was leaving. I was going to leave. I was going to resign. And I had people say, we need this message in the church. I said, they don't want it. I had people say, you don't have to say everything you know. We believe the same thing you do, but you don't have to. And I said, what are, what are you telling me? I've been praying for truth. That was always part of my prayer. God, show me the truth. Teach me the truth. Now, you know what I meant? I had the truth. I don't know if you've noticed from last time, I'm not the smoothest, most polished guy. Thanks, John. <laughs> I love you, brother. Somebody speaks the truth. I'm not that guy. And so I said, my prayer was, Lord, refine me, polish me. And when the Lord opened up the truth to me, I backed up against the wall and He said, you've been asking for this a long time. Where are you going? And so what happened was this. We left. We was on a journey. It was like everything was new. I remember one night me and my wife were talking and I mean, it was pretty intense and she was crying. And she said, if I have to change my mind one more time on something, I said, what if we have to change our minds a hundred more times that we would truly know who Christ is? I don't know if it's been a hundred, but it's been a lot. It's been quite a journey. And then I could go on and, and tell you how that we drifted. When you go from exclusive, we're the only ones, to now you're into this big open world of what do we do now? You just go through websites, and I'm like, yeah, I agree with that, that, that. And it'd be like, whoa, not that. Can't go there. Yeah, 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 no. And this just went on and on and on. So we started visiting churches. For me, that was pretty fun. For about three times. It wasn't fun for her on the first one. But what happened was through these next probably about six years, maybe less than that, I'm not sure, but we we just kept going to where we were, you know, and we, we, we went to a church for about a year and a little over a year and uh, about three or four months. I knew we wouldn't be there long. I just knew because some of the doctrinal things, but, but on one hand, it was so good to be welcomed in. We hadn't experienced that in, in some time. But here was another move that God did in my life. I fell into a home church. They wanted me to be the pastor. We was just meeting in a house. At first, it was great. I mean, it was just, man, it was like, uh, like the, you know, a bunch of misfits. And we just all come together and it was just this honeymoon experience. We were just, and then people, what they believed started coming out and this thing was crazy. But it was through this time that I ran across a guy named Ray Comfort. And for the first time, I understood how to clearly present what I knew in my heart, but I didn't know how to really say it, how to really share the gospel. And then it was through that that one of my co-authors, one of my best friends, Justin Wright, he's, a, he's a, an ag teacher at, at our high school in our town, and he called me up one day. Yeah, Justin's been here. Y'all might have met him. He called me one day and he said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He said, you got to come up here to this school. Now, you got to understand, this is far enough back a few years where internet, like we had dial-up maybe. You know, to watch a two-minute thing might take you two days. So, he said, you've got to see this video. I said, what is it? He said, you just got to come see it. And I go up there, and it was back when Wretched Radio was called Way of the Master Radio. And there was a guy preaching, and the, t and the video was just titled, I think it was Kaboom or Baboom or something like that. Didn't even give the young man's name. And I watched this 11-minute clip 
of a man named Paul Washer. That one still puts chills on you, doesn't it? You know the famous, I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know his name. But at that point in my life, everything that God was working in my heart, I thought I was losing my mind, church. I thought what I see in the Bible, what I see is real. I don't see it out here. I thought I must be crazy. I must be losing my mind on what the, the reality of serving the Lord really is. And then I heard this guy preaching that. And I remember thinking, I don't know who that guy is or where he goes to church, but everything he's saying is what's burning in my heart. And that's where we came to the place that we're at today. That's kind of my testimony in a nutshell. I had said earlier that you need to learn this about your testimony. You need to have a short version. And you need to have kind of a medium type version. That would be what I'm doing right now. And then you need to have that time where you can really sit down and you can share your testimony. I wonder today, I wonder, you're, I look at all the people sitting here, and I wonder, you know, you're members together, but I wonder if you really know each other's testimony. I find this a lot of times when you, when you meet people and you, you, for the first time, one of my favorite things to do, and we did a little this last night, Tell me about your testimony when God saved you. You will be shocked. We went through this when we, before we merged together where, where we were, uh, where our church is now, we were two small churches 16 miles apart. And we used to meet, we didn't have a building, so during the week we would just meet house to house. There were six families and we would meet house to house. And, uh, and we would have a Bible study. We would eat together. I mean, it was just great. I mean, just this, family just getting together basically but we went through a time where everyone in our little church had they wrote their testimony out and they either read it or just said it and even though I knew some of these people what I thought was really well when I heard them give their testimony there was times there was tears there was times that you were just in shock. You'd think this person's perfect. They've never, they've never really even didn't use their turn signal. And then you would hear it from where they were at. And what that does is that brings, that brings the body of Christ together. You find out that, yeah, you were a person that was unworthy of anything good that God could ever do for you. But in that, He set His affection and His love on you. And there came that day, just like the woman at the well, you're not supposed to go through Samaria if you're a Jew, right? But Jesus said, I have a divine appointment today. There's a lady coming to draw water at noon because she's not even welcome with the other women. I've got a meeting with her. You see, every one of you has that testimony today. Every one. I listened to Kyle the other night and raised in church. Good family. Kyle's one of those guys that if I was a little more intelligent, I would be nervous around. It's good to be a little clueless at times. And you say, why is that? Well, when I went back to our church, I said, this guy is, he's, every, every word is perfectly just right in the right spot. I'm not that guy. When Dexter asked me, you know, man, you got to go down there and meet Brother Kyle. You got to meet the church. And I said, what have you told them? He's like, oh, man, I've told. I said, stop telling anybody anything. Said, You're setting me up, brother. But when Kyle started talking about his testimony, he said, it's, it's not exciting. Man, I'm sorry, but it is. You see, unlike so many testimonies that where I was this, I was out there, Kyle has a testimony of, I was raised up in church. God kept me from a lot of things. What a testimony. 
But even in that, there came that day that God said, Kyle, you're not right with me. Every testimony is a miracle of God. But remember, you're not the star. Your testimony is your testimony. It's different from mine. But I can tell you this, you can be at work, somebody can have all these thoughts or whatever, and you can say, let me just tell you about me. You, you think I don't do wrong? Well, let me tell you what I was like. And you can just, you can bullet point right through that thing, and it will always end on, and Jesus Christ came into my life and saved someone like me. So, you want to...